Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews and chapter number 8. The book of Hebrews and chapter number 8. We are continuing tonight with our series of the book of Hebrews and not a lot of messages left. We're on the downhill slope now as we've been walking through this a uh, great, wonderful book that points up to Jesus Christ. Now, the beginning part of the book of Hebrews, we've been explaining that Jesus Christ is better, that Jesus Christ is better than the angels, Jesus Christ is better than Moses, that Jesus Christ is better than Aaron, Jesus Christ is better than Joshua. And now we come to another ideal of this, that the cross, Calvary, is a better way. And we, as we enter into this section, and we've already been been starting in on it, we now come to the meat of the matter of this idea here, and we find our way to the book of Hebrews in chapter number 8. The book of Hebrews and chapter number 8. And notice with me starting at verse number 6. The book of Hebrews chapter number 8, starting at verse number 6. The word of God says this, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also is he the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises? For if that first covenant had been faultless, then it should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I have made with their fathers in the day which I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded that not saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and I will write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they will be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for he shall know me from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. <laughs> In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of Hebrews chapter number 8? The book of Hebrews in chapter number 8, and notice with me in verse number 6, notice the phrase, a better covenant. A better covenant. And with the Lord's help, we would like to explain from this passage here, dealing with Jesus Christ and how God had given a better covenant covenant. If you wouldn't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God, a God who is worthy to be worshiped and worthy to be served. Thank you so much for this better covenant that you provided for us. And I ask that you help us to understand, to be able to get a grasp on this, to be able to see what you are getting across and the importance of this new covenant compared to the old covenant. Again, we want to be clear and we want to be a help to these good folks tonight. Again, I dare not trust my own with a lot of things on my mind and a lot of things on my heart, as well as a lot of things on these good folks out here with many things that they're thinking about. I'm asking that for right now that you would set those things aside and that you would encourage us with these better promises from this better covenant that we could be drawn close to you and see what a wonderful God you truly are. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, 
In a clear division, we would consider the Old Testament, specifically the Mosaic Law, considered the Old Covenant. Remember the word covenant just means an agreement. It carries the idea of a contract. It is a promise that is made between two parties. And that in the Old Testament, you had the Mosaic Covenant. And in this reference, it is considered the Old Covenant. Now, in the New Testament, we have a complete contrast. We have what is called the New Covenant. Sometimes we would call it the New Testament, but it's dealing with what Jesus Christ has done for us. Now, the covenants, the promises of the Old Covenant were conditional to the fulfillment of the terms by the Hebrew people. And by the way, this is a good time to put an emphasis on this, and we're going to see it, that the New Covenant and the Old Covenant were written to the Hebrew people and for the purpose of the Hebrew people and promises to the Hebrew people. Now, as we come to the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Law, that we know that it was conditional to the fulfillment of the terms of the Hebrew people. What do I mean by this? Well, God says basically that in order to go to heaven, in order to have fellowship with God, you have to be perfect. And someone may say, well, what does that mean to be perfect? Well, the Bible says thou shalt <laughs> not bear false witness. Don't tell lies. Well, the Bible says that in order for you to be in fellowship with God, you have to be perfect. And it was conditional to the people fulfilling their end of the bargain, their f side of the contract. Sure, you could be with God, but you have to be perfect. And the problem was, is that the people, no people, no person at any time could ever live up to that standard. Nobody ever could. And by the way, God knew that, and we're going to cover that in here in a second. Now, in a complete contrast to that, we have the new covenant, which was not dependent upon man or the Hebrew people or a group of people. It was dependent upon Jesus Christ and these promises were unconditional. What were the promises of the new covenant? Jesus says, come unto me. Come unto me. Whosoever will, come unto me. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now the promises that Jesus made was to himself, speaking to God, he made it upon himself. And the new covenant was better because it wasn't conditioned on us. None of us could live perfect. It was based off of the condition of Jesus Christ and whom he was. So with that as a backdrop, just giving a quick little understanding, let's explain more about this new covenant, this better covenant. The first thing I'd like to show to you from the book of Hebrews chapter 8 is that it is an improved covenant. It is an improved covenant. This covenant is improved compared to the last one. Notice with me in verse number 6. But now he hath obtained, that's Jesus, hath obtained a more excellent ministry. Now remember, this is in direct uh, um, context of Jesus becoming the high priest. That he is a high priest. Now that he is a high priest, now that he has fulfilled these things, but now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also is he, Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Now, think about the giving of the Ten Commandments, which is part of the Mosaic Law. That God gave the Ten Commandments. And almost immediately, immediately, the children of Israel broke almost all of them making a golden calf. It took them no time at all. They didn't wait a year. They didn't wait a uh, half a year. They didn't even wait a month. They had broken all of God's covenants almost at once with this golden calf. Now, if their going to heaven was based off of how well they kept the law, well, they failed and fumbled the ball immediately. It was immediately ruined. Immediately gone. <laughs> they, they couldn't keep it at all. And what that showed us is that this first covenant was something nobody could keep. Not a single person, even the people who crossed the Red Sea, watch God do all of these miracles. They messed up immediately. 
It just showed this law was unkeepable. I still laugh at people who when I knock on the doors and they say, Oh, sure, I know I'm going to heaven. How do you know I'm going to heaven? Because I keep all the commandments. That's amazing to me because the children of Israel fumbled the ball immediately. Let me tell you, nobody can keep the law. That was the whole purpose of the Old Testament law, or that was the whole thing. Nobody could keep it. Not a single person. Now, the thing about the old law is that there was no grace. You broke the law for the wages of sin is death. There is no wiggle room. Because we sinned, we owe God a price. No ands, ifs, or buts. If you broke the law, you deserve to die. There was no grace and nobody could keep it. So when Jesus Christ gave us this new covenant, it had better promises. The better promises is one out of grace. In this uh, covenant, God assumed all of the commitment. What was the commitment? For the wages of sin is death. God says, I'll take care of that for you. I will take care of the death. You don't worry about paying that price. I will pay the price for you. Now, let's put it down in a more temporal thing. If somebody said, you know what? You look like you need a new car. Well, you say, well, I do need a new car, but I can't afford one. It just doesn't work in the budget. Well, how about this? I will take all of the commitment. Now, if they tell you that, what, what do you, I assume all the responsibility. I assume all the liability. What would you assume they're going to do? Pay for it all. Well, that's what Jesus Christ did. He said, let me give you this promise. You can go to heaven. I will assume all all of the responsibility. I will assume all of the commitment. I will take care of everything. Will you accept it? Well, yeah, that's a great deal. In the old law, the person who committed the crime had the commitment for the wages of sin is death. Now, no one wants to pay the price for that. We all laugh about in our country where they offer things for free. But let me tell you, God offered it for free. Amen. It is yours. I'll take all the commitment. I will pay the price. I will take upon me the responsibility. Isn't that a better promise? The promise, the deal is I die or someone dies on my behalf. Which would you choose? Well, I'd rather someone pay that price so I wouldn't have to. It is based off of better promises because it's based off of the commitment that Jesus has. He paid it. And by the way, this covenant cannot fail because Jesus fulfilled the demand of the covenant. He paid all the price. When he died on the cross, it was enough for everyone who ever lived in every sin that it was ever committed. Jesus paid the price. He paid for it all. And because of that, it will never fail. Meaning he won't default on the loan. He won't miss a payment. It's already been paid in full. It is free, full, and forever. That is a better promise. That is a better commitment. It is much improved covenant. As we go on, as we see more about this new covenant compared to the old covenant, not only is it an improved covenant, but we also see it is a needed covenant. It is a needed covenant. Notice with me in verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second for finding fault with him, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, the second covenant is a better covenant because it was needed. What do we mean by this? Well, it's saying here that if the first covenant had been faultless, if it had been perfect, then there would be no need for the second. But we understand that the first covenant in dealing with salvation was not enough to give us salvation. It was not enough to put us a home in heaven. It was not enough to forgive our sins. Now, in that sense, we could see that it was not enough. Let me put a pause here. The old, test, the old covenant was not faulty in its design. 
What was its design? It was our schoolmaster to show us, I need Jesus. Next to every one of the Ten Commandments, you could put in big boxcar letters, I need Jesus. The whole purpose of the Old Covenant was to point out our need of a Savior. And in that, the Old Testament did its job well. The Old Covenant did its job well. If you ever want to work with someone and show them that they're a sinner, you just take the Ten Commandments and walk through the Ten Commandments. And by the time you're done, if they are honest, they would have to admit that they're a sinner, that we're faulty. So in that, the Old Covenant did its job But in the idea of getting us saved or forgiving us of our sins, it was not enough. It was faulty in that sense. Meaning that nobody ever got to heaven or nobody ever will get to heaven by keeping the law. It is impossible. Nobody can do that. It was faulty in that nobody was promised eternal life based off of the law. We were promised eternal death. We were promised separation from God. We were promised punishment from a holy righteous God. And so the old covenant, the old testament, the law, Mosaic law was not enough to save anybody, to give them salvation, to forgive them of their sins. But the new covenant, it is. And so it was necessary. It was needed. So much so that Here, the author of the book of Hebrews, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, goes back and quotes Jeremiah. Now, this is important because in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, God gives them what is called the new covenant. We know that he gave the Hebrew people four specific promises. And the last promise that he gave to the Hebrew people was what was called the new covenant. By the way, this is what all of this is based off, the new covenant. Let me also remind you that God gave the promise of the new covenant to the Hebrew people, not to the Gentiles. You say, why is this a big deal? Well, the Bible speaks about in John chapter 4, where Jesus is talking to the um, woman at the well, that he says salvation is of the Jews. What do we mean by that? That God made promises to save the Hebrew people, but because of the power of Jesus' blood, when he died on the cross, it was enough for the whole world. The Bible gives this of the parable of the hidden treasure. There was a guy who went out into the middle of the field, found the treasure, and in order to get the treasure, he bought the entire field so he could have the treasure. Well, the treasure was was Hebrew, the uh, Hebrew people. So in order to get the Hebrew people saved, he also paid for the entire world. This is a wonderful thing. It is because of the promises that God made to the Hebrew people that we as Gentiles get to enjoy this promises. Now that's something wonderful. We are the byproducts of promises God made to the Hebrew people. And throughout the rest of this chapter, there's going to be a great emphasis on the promises God made to the Hebrew people concerning the new covenant. Because of the new covenant, Jesus Christ died for them. That is part of the the, uh, necessary. This is part of what had to be done. That Jesus Christ uh, died to save the Hebrew people, but it was also enough for us. It was a needed covenant because the Old Testament could not save. The Old Testament economy couldn't save. The Old Testament law couldn't save. But Jesus Christ is able to save by grace As we accept that free gift. So as we are talking about the new covenant compared to the old covenant. The first thing that we understand is that it was an improved covenant. We also understand it was a needed covenant. As we continue on we also see this. It was an important covenant. It was an important covenant. Notice with me in verse number 9. Not according to the covenant I have made with their fathers in the day which I took them into the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So God starts off by saying, The new covenant is an important covenant because God takes the responsibility for it. We notice that he uses the phrase, I will, in here. Verse number 10. 
For this is the covenant that I will make. And he goes on, I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be unto them a God. Notice the phrases, I will. Once again in verse number 12. For I will be merciful. What we're seeing is that in this new covenant, it's important because God takes responsibility for it. He's not leaving it for the people to earn it. He's not leaving it for the people to keep it up. He's not waiting for the people to keep their end of the bargain. God says, I will take care of this. I will. In verse number 11, or verse number, where am I at now? For in verse number 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds. Notice this is God's promise to them. I'm going to do this and I will write them in their hearts and I will be unto them a God and they shall be my, to me a people. Here he's giving this idea here that God is going to do this. Now, when is this all going to be fulfilled in its entirety, in its completeness? Notice with me, if you don't mind, as we continue. It says um, in verse number 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. After those days. Notice this phrase here, after those days. What is this after those days? Well, what it's being referred to is after the days of unbelief. After the days of unbelief. Now, remember what's going on in God's calendar. After Jesus Christ um, lived on this earth, died on the cross, he rose from the grave on the third day and he ascended up to heaven, that the Hebrew people as a nation, we know individuals accept it Christ, but as a nation they rejected Jesus Christ as being their coming Messiah. That They rejected Jesus Christ from being, from being the fulfillment of all the promises that God made for them. And so they entered into a period of unbelief. Now God was not finished with them, but he set them aside. We're now in a parenthetical phrase, a uh, period of the promises that God made to the Hebrew people. That we know that according to the book of Daniel, there are 70 weeks of prophecy, 69 weeks have been fulfilled, and there's one more yet to be fulfilled. We're in a parenthesis period. And during this parenthesis period, God has now turned to the Gentiles to work with them. And he's working with us, and he's allowing us to come to know Christ as our Savior. We also call this the church age. But there is a time and period where the end cap of the parentheses is closed. When that happens, an event called the rapture will occur. And God is going to call us away, all of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. Then what's going to happen is that there's going to be a period of time called the tribulation. The purpose of the tribulation is not for the Gentiles. It is not for the church. It is to bring the Hebrew people to himself. And so during that seven years, God is working directly for and to the Hebrew people to bring them to himself and to use them as instruments during that period of time, not the church. The church is going to be removed from that because God is working with the Hebrew people once again. After the seven years of tribulation, God is going to put a period of time called the thousand year reign, the millennial kingdom where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign on this earth. And during the millennial kingdom is going to be the fulfillment of the promises God made to the Hebrew people. Now we as Gentiles will get to enjoy the promises God had made to the Hebrew people. Once again, we're riding on the coattails of the Hebrew people and the promises God made to them. Praise the Lord for that. This is why we should be thankful for the Hebrew people because without them, we would not have salvation because God was working with the Hebrew people. And this phrase here is dealing with the idea after those days, after the time of unbelief of the Hebrew people, this is going to be fulfilled in its entirety. So God had already set the stage by having Jesus Christ die on the cross and make salvation available. During the tribulation period, he is working to bring the Hebrew people to himself. And in the millennial kingdom is going to be the final fulfillment 
of the promise of the new covenant that God had made in the book of Jeremiah and then repeated in the book of Ezekiel. Notice again as we come to verse number 10. <clears throat> for, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. So now we know the time frame. Thus saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and will write in their hearts and I will be unto them a God and they shall be unto me a people. Now again, he's primarily speaking to the Hebrew people and saying in this time, they will not need a checklist to do what's right and wrong. Aren't you glad for that? To live the Christian life, you don't need a checklist. You know what you need to do? Follow after Jesus. As long as you're following after Jesus, you will do what's right. Aren't you glad we don't need a checklist? Now, thankful we have reminders and there's preachers who try to encourage us. But to be honest, if you just make a decision to follow after Christ and take those steps to follow after Christ, you will naturally do what is right. Now, this is in contrast to us as Gentiles who are used to being saved. It's fine. It's not a big deal. But if you go to the Hebrew people who had 613 laws to keep, and then on top of that they had commentaries on the law, and then the commentaries and the commentaries, where everything became such a complicated thing. This is a relief! I don't have to remember all of these laws. I don't have to remember all of these things, and to stand like this, and to wear this, and do this. I have the simple life of just following after Christ. Isn't that a better way of living? Just follow after Christ and I will naturally do what is right. This is a promise that God gave to them to lift that burden of the law that has been placed upon them partly by their own doing. But again, 613 laws is still a lot to keep. Especially since they couldn't keep them on their own. And to lift that burden up and say, guess what? They're not going to have to remember this checklist. I'm going to write it in their minds and I'm going to write them in their hearts. And I will be unto them a God and they shall be unto me a people. Notice in verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor. Notice that. They shall not teach. Today we have something called soul winning. Why do we have soul winning? Because we have to go out on purpose to go tell people about Christ. But in verse number 11, notice this. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. Why? For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Remember, Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign in the millennial kingdom. And the people have the opportunity to know him personally. You're not going to go up to someone and say, have you ever heard of Jesus? They're not going to look at you like, no, who's that? Sometimes we get that door knocking. Who's this? Everybody's going to know who Jesus Christ is. He's the leader. He's the ruler. He's the king of everyone. Everyone knows who he is. And so we're not going to have to try to convince people to know Jesus personally. You just say, there he is. And people say, I know him. Won't that be a better covenant, a better time of living? Especially for the Hebrew people, because God has point brought them to himself and says, listen, I want you to know me personally. I want you to know me. Every person will know me. It's my promise to them. Notice again in verse number 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. This covenant caused God to have mercy and not bring up their sins. Now, I want you to think about how much the Hebrew people have turned away from God. From the very beginning of this whole thing. You take... As they followed after Moses in the wilderness. They had the privilege of seeing the plagues. They watched God open up the Red Sea. Then God spoke to them from Mount Sinai. On his own voice. And gave them the Ten Commandments. And they said yes we'll do whatever you say. Less than 40 days later. They're having a big party serving a, a false idol. A golden calf that they built it. You imagine, again, we, we just got through going over the life and ministry of Moses. How many times was God upset with those people? Quite a bit. And how many times was it threatened that God says, forget these people? Well, God says, I'm not going to do that. 
I'm going to remember the promises. I'm not going to hold against them all the things they did against me. Think about the Hebrew people as a nation turning against Jesus Christ and denying him as their Messiah. Even those who had someone come up and tell them that Jesus is the Messiah and they purposely turned away. And they reject it. God's promises to them. God says, I'm not going to remember that. I'm not going to hold it against them. I'm going to set that little aside. And I want to work with them because I love them. Isn't that a better covenant? Isn't that a better way? Oh, what a great privilege that we have there. It is an important covenant. Which brings us to one last thing dealing with this new covenant. That we said it is an improved covenant. It is a needed covenant. It is an important covenant. We also see this. It is an implemented covenant. It is an implemented covenant. Notice in verse 13. In that he saith a new covenant. He hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now once again the author here is placing an emphasis on Jeremiah's promise of the new covenant. And he's putting an emphasis on the word new. Alright, so if you have something that is new, that means the old thing by definition is old. You can figure that with no help, right? If you have a new pair of shoes, the shoes that you had before that by default are old. And what needs to happen to the old shoes if you've worn them out? They need to be set aside, put away. You now concentrate on the new pair of shoes. Now with this new covenant, it will never wax old. But by definition, it makes the other one old. And it makes it so it's ready to vanish away. Now we can still learn from it. But let me tell you that old covenant doesn't bring us to salvation. The new covenant does. The new covenant gives us spiritual blessings. And we have salvation. And God made promises to the Hebrew people. And he's going to go for it. And it is available right now. We have it available right now. That we don't have to suffer through the Old Testament until the millennial kingdom. Jesus Christ has already died in preparation for the promises he's going to make real, fulfilled to the Hebrew people. He's already died on the cross. It is available for us now, for us to receive, that is already available. It is new. It is available. It is implemented. And all we have to do is trust it for ourselves. And once we have, we get to look forward to the blessings that God is going to deliver to the Hebrew people that we get to write in and enjoy as God is blessing those Hebrew people. In the millennial kingdom. Oh this is such a wonderful thing. As we understand about this new covenant. That God has given to us. That he has given us a better promises. Because he has fulfilled it. He has taken responsibility. All that we have to do is accept the promise. And once we accept the promise. Now we just learning about. All the things that we get to enjoy in the future. And we get a plan. No wonder that the Bible says this is a better covenant based off of better promises. What a wonderful God that we have. So if the promises we know in the future for the Hebrew people is that God is going to write his word on their hearts. And he's going to have it in their minds. May I tell you that as a Christian you get to enjoy that yourself now. Just follow after Christ. You don't need a checklist. You don't need bondage here on earth. You just need to make a decision to follow after Christ. Which bears the question, are you following after Christ? It is very quite simple to see in your life. Are you growing closer to him every day? Are you pursuing after him? Is he the desire after your heart? Do you wake up every morning and say, maybe this is the day I get to see him? Do you go to bed at night saying, maybe tomorrow is the time that my shepherd boy comes back from me? Is your heart after him? Are you desiring after him? Do you have the same prayer that Paul and Moses had at the height of their ministry? That I may know him. Let me tell you, if you find yourself, and we do from time to time, come to the place where we find us messing up and messing up and messing up and messing up. Let me tell you what the answer is. Look unto Jesus. Follow after him. Sure, you could get little reminders of reading your Bible and stuff. And reading your Bible is important. Praying is important. 
But let me tell you, the Christian life is not a checklist. The Christian life is pursuing after Christ. And as you pursue after Christ, you will find yourself naturally doing those things that you ought to do. If you are following after Christ, you don't need to be reminded to read your Bible. If you are following after Christ, you do not have to be reminded to pray. If you are following after Christ, you don't have to be reminded to obey your parents. If you are following after Christ, you don't need a reminder that I need to love my wife. If I'm following after Christ, I don't need a reminder to be a good employee. If I'm following after Christ, by the way, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. One of the evidences that we're following after Christ is he makes us fishers of men. Let me tell you, the Christian life is this simple. That once you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, look unto Jesus and follow him. So quite simply, let me ask you tonight. Are you following after him? Are you pursuing after him? Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.